Well, see, I, I was almost hesitant to do this, and then everybody was like, just go and do it, because I um, I don't speak as well as I write, Yeah. So, and I always wish I could do that, and I tend to get a little bit tongue-tied at times. And, but, but, I mean, that's so. kind of like, I, I think all creative people kind of have that we use another form of communication because maybe we're not the most outgoing person or maybe we're, you know, not good at speaking, so we draw. Right, you know? right, right. That's so, your outlet. Yeah. Right. Um, but that's normal. Um, well, welcome back in Ebriite, because we're already recording. Um, and we're here with, whew, all right, ready? Laurie Nicopolis. Yes, you got it right. Sweet. That Good was a tough job. one. And I'm reading it and everything. But... I still have trouble with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, author of An Afternoon by the Sea. And we are not shy about self-promoting our upcoming event, Pages and Pints, which will be held uh, August 20th at Mayflower Brewery. And Laurie will be there with her book. And thank you for inviting me and having me. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, it just seemed like a no-brainer because we were really... Um, we're not struggling. We just, like, we try to always have a backlog of episodes. And then you're like, all right, we have, like, two months worth of episodes. And then, you know, Fish, my producer, would be like, we have one episode left. And be like, we had two months. He's like, yeah, it was two months ago. <laughs> um, so then it just became like, oh, we have all these authors that are, are going to be taking part. We should kind of use that, you know. So that's kind of where the idea came from. I think it's, ex- uh, excuse me, exciting because it's all books. Yes. Usually when I go to the marketplace, there's a variety of other mm-hmm. things and people go there focused on what they're actually look. They know what they're going to be right. looking for when they get there. Or they're now, not looking for anything. You know, they're just there to kind of like shop in general. But and, with yeah. this, they know it's yeah. books. So yeah. that's going to be their focus. Hopefully. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. The idea came from a... Uh, a good friend of mine, Cassandra, and she saw a brewery do something similar. And she's like, do you remember those um, scholastic book fairs when you were a kid? I'm like, oh, yeah. She's like, you should do one at a brewery. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, I don't want to order a bunch of books. That doesn't make sense to me. And then, like, uh, probably, like, a month or two went by, and she brought it up again. I'm like, yeah, I, I mean, then i got to order books and sit on all this inventory. She's like, you don't understand what I'm saying. And I'm like, I clearly am not. And then she explained <laughs> it to me, and I'm like, Oh, we can totally do that. And that's where it came from. And I mean, we have, I think, like 15 or 16 authors. Wow. It's a great outlet for independent authors, yep. too. Because we and then we even brought in a mom and pop uh, bookstore, too, because we figure that's an important part of you know literature and, and, and books is kind great. of that small. So we have one mom and pop bookstore. And uh, the only rule that she has is don't bring books of people who are there. Oh, um, <laughs> Because obviously she doesn't want to sell your book when you're selling it five feet away. Right, right. Um, yeah, so we got uh, the other thing I was worried about is it being like all kids' books or all horror books, but we have horror and mystery and kids' books and cookbooks and um, I think we even have a, a coloring book and just like it seems wow. like it's a really broad assortment. I'm trying to get a, a western. Um, someone else contacted me tonight. I can't remember even what they wrote. Yeah. Oh, it's a true crime serial killer you know so you know variety. those books yeah, that people right. love <laughs> no i'm really excited i'm glad you're allowing us the opportunity to do that i yeah. think it's a great It'll venue yeah and mayflower is great they let us do whatever we want yeah you know we can be like we have a weird idea and I'm like all right oh, so that's great um an afternoon by the sea is not a true crime or serial killer book no it is based on a, a true incident okay um, i i came across this um, artist who was um, dealing with self-doubt and creativity um, Ooh, and how perfectionism yep. started to permeate the mind and create so much chaos that she could not get through the painting that she had worked on for three years. Oh, um, and it was the most beautiful painting. It was up on a, a, an easel. I think it was three feet by five foot canvas. Um, and every time I went to the house, there it was in the room, and she'd be working on it. And mm-hmm. I just admired it so much. And um, one day I went to visit, and the canvas was em- the um, easel was empty. And I said to her, "Where's the painting?" And she came out with a little four by six piece of the canvas. And I said, "What is that?" And she said, "I just couldn't take the painting anymore. I carved it up." Interesting. Um, so at that point, <clears throat> I went home and I thought, "Wow." 
this is really intense, the way that perfectionism and self-doubt can really affect creativity Mm -hmm. and dampen the creative process and get people to the point where after three years of working on what I thought was the most beautiful painting, and I'm not an artist, which I always wished I had that ability, um, I thought this is a really strong force. So I wrote this book, um, which has a lot to do with perfectionism and how it, you know, creates a lot of chaos and um, and it's just um, the auth- the artist in the book gets to the point as the original artist that I wrote the story about where she just can't take it anymore and she tries to um, find a different form of expression within her painting mm-hmm. so she moves away from detail starts to go more towards abstraction because it doesn't seem to affect her mind as much about things being so perfect. That's fascinating because I feel like so many people enjoy, I mean, we were in beer mug paintings and wine glass paintings and people are always like, this is so much fun. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, you can always have this kind of fun. Like creating things is, is fun. But for some reason in that, you know, when you get a couple wines in somebody, they're less concerned about being perfect. Whereas if you're just like, hey, today we're going to, you know, draw the human figure, which we have a figure drawing group. And some people are like, oh, I can't do that. And like, of course you can. But like, people have that mindset when they're done, it's supposed to be ready to hang in the Louvre. And it's like, that's not, that's not the point. Right. Like, it, right. It's about practice and enjoying the process. I think they need to lower their expectations a little bit to For enjoy sure. the yeah. creativity. Yeah. Um, sometimes you get so caught up in what other people are going to think about your process, mm-hmm. your colors, your creative, the outcome of your creativity, that I think you're not looking at it in a way that, yeah, that's good enough for me. Yeah. Right? I've worked on it all this time. That's good enough for me. I, you tend to look at it from the outside instead of from what brought it out from your inside. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's making sense. No, right I, now, I, 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 I get it. Yeah. Right. So, and I think you need to lower your expectations a little bit. Nothing's perfect. Right. Um, in the, in the book, the painter has a beautiful day on the beach and she's painting the scenery and she's so entranced with nature, but then she starts to doubt, am I really seeing nature? Am I depicting it the way that I'm seeing it? Mm-hmm. Um, then she falls in love with it. Then she gets home and then she critiques it. And then she thinks, no, who am I to recreate this beautiful scene that nature presented to me, you know? Um, nature is perfect. I'm not perfect. I could never perfect what nature has shown me yeah. on this beautiful day. Well, she's not thinking that nature is not perfect. Nothing's perfect. Correct. There are anomalies yeah. in nature. Yeah. There's anomalies everywhere. Um, so I think we we need to look at something and realize that, yes, we can recreate that, but it doesn't have to be exactly mm-hmm. down to every single detail that we are seeing, we can lighten up a little and give it our own little tweaks. Sure. Right? So this came about, the other thing about this which really hit me was I have an eye for things and growing up and even now I hear people say, oh, she's got an eye, meaning that I can find imperfection in anything. Yeah. It's a curse. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And some days I'm like, please make this go away. In a way, though, I think perfection can be a catalyst for doing an excellent job, Mm -hmm. even in the workforce. I mean, it it pushes you to do a little bit more than maybe you would normally do. Um, You pay more attention to detail. But I think in the creativity process, when it comes to art and writing and something that you know other people are going to critique, I think it can be very detrimental. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think, like, it's a good thing to strive for, knowing that you really can't get there. Right. You You can only get to a point. Yeah. Right? Um, And I think going from, in the book, I don't want to give too much away because it is a very short read. Um, Mm -hmm. I left the genre open for people to tell me what they think the type of book it is. Some people have told me that it's a narrative poem, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I see it. Some people have told me that it's a reflection book. I definitely see that. Yeah. And I tell people when they read it, 
don't read it quickly. It's a quick read. Yeah. Um, I said, go over each line. Sit back and think about that first page. Maybe has four lines on it. Read it. Sit back and think about it. Absorb it. I tried to put words into short sentences that would pack a punch. Yeah. You know, make you really sit and think about it. And um, I think at the end, the you know, it says her from her beautiful depiction of nature she's reduced to abstraction because she just can't take it anymore of trying to perfect that that painting um and people say well what why would you use the word reduced well she is reduced to abstraction it's less detail mm -hmm. you don't have to be as accurate with abstraction you can create anything you want um and get the point across in a subtle way right without so much detail right and and i feel like i would i would agree with that being reduced because she was striving for something else and and it's not like they had an obsession with abstract and that's what they wanted to do it sounds like they had a goal in mind that they felt they couldn't achieve and then went with something that I don't know. I don't want to say less challenging because abstract can be pretty challenging. Can be pretty challenging. Yeah. Right. 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 But but, and and again, it's it's so it's so strange. Like the the creative process, um, I have become obsessed with single line drawings. So you put your pen down, and then you never pick your no. pen up until it's done. <laughs> and w when people know what you're doing. They're like, oh my god, this is amazing. But it's because it's framed in a single line. I mean, you know, sometimes the arms are not the right length, and you know, the eyes will be offset. And, but when you kind of understand the process that went into it, people are kind of more forgiving than they might be if you were just like, oh, I drew this old man face. And they'd be like, well, I mean, all the eyes are off. You know, the eyes are off, and so it, it's weird that like. I almost feel like setting that restriction on myself made it easier for me because I'm like, it's not going to be perfect. And I have that kind of out. Right. And they yeah. understand that's a different type of process to right. get to that point. Yeah. Right. So um, I just wanted to give a little bit sure, of a synopsis sure, sure. from the book. The book is 64 pages. There's just There are just a few lines per page. I hide in... Um, incredible illustrator and I wanted her to be part of this podcast because she just put life to my words her. yeah um, but she's in a remote area of Montana right now and she could not um, oh get she's doing well, some field work some sure. drawing and um, when she's around we can get around yeah, yeah so we did the um, it's uh, illustrated so when I do sell the book at the marketplaces people tend to think it's a children's book I will be 100% honest I thought it was too right because yeah. you don't really find adult books that are um, illustrated so and it's kind of a, the format too where it's kind of like a square book and it's not a lot of pages that tends to right it's 64 yeah. pages it's also embossed I put so much um, into this book and some of the paintings I use things that were very sentimental to me that I gave her and said I need you to copy this put this in the book and mm -hmm. so I really put a lot into the book my goal was tabletop book yep at a nice coastal home or any home sure um, put it down someone picks it up reads line by line and then it generates some really powerful discussion mm -hmm. that's my goal yeah so um but I, the synopsis was creativity and self-doubt. In creativity and self-doubt, how do we eradicate the mental conflict that arises when we wallow in the idea of perfectionism? Do we persevere and outwit the gnawing desire for perfection, or do we focus on the alternative? There's always an alternative, right? Of course, yeah. The artist in this story represents a great many of those who sometimes become overwhelmed while striving for perfection. Although her ultimate reaction and actions might not be right, the right solution for everyone, for this artist, it was a catharsis, which allowed her to explore an alternative form of, a, of expression. And then I quoted Pablo Picasso, who said, there is no abstract art. You must always start with something. Afterward, you can remove all traces of reality. So in this, I feel like the reality for the artist was, this is too 
too much for me. It's too chaotic for me to try to duplicate this beauty that I'm seeing and to get to perfect these lines and these drawings and um, you know what I'm saying: trees and be in the ocean and birds and mm-hmm. so. I tried, you know, where it says, where he says, you know, you have to always start with something. So she starts with something and she realizes it's just too much for her, but she doesn't want to give up that ability to paint. And yeah. She loves to be an artist. So she goes to abstraction mm-hmm. where the detail isn't as focused. And, but she had to learn from something else. Sure. Right. Yeah. She had to go through something else. Like we all have to live and learn. We all have our moments when bad things happen and we've learned from that experience. So I, um, the other quote that I really loved that I put in this book was um, about nature, and it's by Maxine Legace, and it says, by discovering nature, you discover yourself. And I feel like at the end of this book, she discovers herself as an artist, and nature helped her to do that. So procrastination is not the word I'm looking for. Self doubt and kind of that that um, imposter syndrome. Did you struggle with any of that when you were writing the book? Because it is a creative process. And no, I struggled with it after I completed the book. When I put the book out there for other people to see, yeah. I went through the creativity and self doubt. Yeah. And I thought, this is just what I wrote about. Um, fortunately, I didn't destroy the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had no desire to do that. I love the book. I think. And I love the way it came out, and I was very happy with it because I put my heart and soul in it. Mm-hmm. It's I worked on it for three years, and I worked with the um, editor, and I worked with the book designer, and the the illustrator, and we all became very good friends, and we were all on the same page most of the time. There were very few times where I had to change some of the process. Yeah. But then when I put it out, like I said earlier on when we were talking, we need to look at things from what came out from inside of us and how we project that and not worry about the critiquing and what we think other people are going to th- going to think because you have no idea what other people are going to think. Mm-hmm. You can assume that someone's going to look at something and think of it the same way that you're looking at it, but that's highly unlikely. Right, yeah. And it, but it, then I did it. Yeah. I did it and I was angry at myself and I said, there I go, I'm writing about creativity and self-doubt I put the book out there and I kept thinking to myself wait is it not good enough is that then I got my first review and it was wonderful and I was very excited about it and then they kept coming in and I kept getting very good reviews and then I then I go through the process again and saying well they just being nice I was they don't say, want to hurt have my you feelings. gotten a bad review <laughs> no and I wish I would because I feel like you can get a hundred compliments or good reviews or whatever when you get one bad review and like that, you'll remember that one word for word. Right. You'll be like, what did I do wrong? And I wish I yeah. would. Yeah. I wish I would because I, then I can see the other side and, and maybe I can read that review and go back to the book and reread the book and pick out what that person is actually saying. Yeah. I don't want everybody... When I, when I give a person a book, I do say to them, look, I'm open to construct, constructive criticism. Right, yeah. That's what I want. I want you to be honest about it. No, I have not gotten that bad review. I know it's coming, and I know I want it, but I don't really know if I'm prepared to oh, react to it. you're not going to want it when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I yeah. just, you know, I mean, I remember my daughter getting accepted to everything she ever did growing up, and yeah. then when she was applying to college... There were a few colleges she didn't get accepted to, and she was devastated. And I thought to myself, this is not good. She never had that moment before where it prepared her for this moment. Right. So, you know, I want that bad review before it goes too far, and then I really don't know how to handle it. Yeah, and I I think a lot of handling it is kind of just a personality thing, and... You know, I, I've always talked to people about starting businesses or, you know, striking out on whatever their creative venture is. And my favorite advice to give anybody on doing something like that is don't. Because if me telling you not to is going to make you even hesitate, you're not going to make it. Because people are going to tell you not to. And um, just recently, so... Um, 
I started Inebriart full time uh, right when the pandemic hit. I got laid off from work, and um, it just seemed like the right time. Zero regrets. It's been fantastic. Good. Stress free? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I ran into someone that I used to work with like 10 years ago. And they're like, oh, what do you do now? I'm like, oh, I just do inebriart. And they like made a face and I was like, oh, do you make enough money doing that? And it was just kind of like, I mean, do I look like I'm starving? I'm not a skinny guy. Like, (laughs) you know, and it was just kind of that people will always be there to kind of be like, you should have a nine to five job. You should have, you know, X amount of dollars in the bank, and this is how you should run your life. But there's really no reason for any of that. You should do what makes you happy. But isn't that the reaction that all artists and performing artists seem to get? Yes. I mean, even when they come... I remember my daughter coming to me and said, Mom, uh, my goal is to major in dance. She was a dancer since she was three years old. And I said, that's fine. That's your passion. I can't tell you what to do. The only thing I ask you to do is maybe double majors so you have a backup and can, because dance is not always going to carry you physically you get to the point where, sure right i said but you don't have to come to me and say is it okay if i do this that's your passion yeah you know so i think that's the response from parents a lot of times when their children they they um, always want them to have a backup and i'm always like screw the backup you're not the backup person forget the backup because it gives you it gives you it gives you an out, you know. Either you're committed a hundred percent. That's a good way to. Because yeah. if it gets going too difficult, you'd be like, "Well, I need to go sociology or mathematics or whatever my other major was," because this is not working out. You know, like COVID. Because I got laid off during COVID, it made it so much easier for me to go full time for an Ebre art because I had no other. I mean, I had other options. But, like, it was either an e is going to take off or I'm going to think, you know? Whereas if I did, never got laid off and COVID never happened, I'd probably still be there. And e would be growing, but at a much slower rate because, you know, I didn't have that out. I didn't have that safety net to go, oh, well, I'm going to go do this other thing because, you know, I need to pay X bill. Now I'm like, I have to ramp and art up more because I have to pay X bill. Well, that's interesting because now I'm thinking of my book. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's almost like she had that out. Yeah. Right. The abstraction was her out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So in the backup, by the way, my daughter did, she does have a backup, Yeah. <laughs> but she's still most pursuing. People, most people do. But she's yeah. still pursuing, you know, her dream. Um, so listening to you I'm like well that pushes you to work even harder and move even harder because that was it there's nothing else to fall back on where in the book maybe she would have pushed harder if all she knew was painting with detail and and no there was nothing else to fall back on like the abstraction so I, I can see the correlation there which is really interesting and you do make a lot of sense with that. I never looked at it that way. Yeah. yeah. But I'm also the kind of person to be like, well, if it doesn't work out, then you just change gears and just go, you know. Yeah. Like podcasting was, I mean, never even on my radar until it kind of like popped in. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. And now, you know, three, four, five, seven hundred episodes in or something like that. Well, I'm on it. Thank yeah. you for inviting me. I yeah, really no appreciate being here and um, putting a word out on my book. And... Um, well, the interesting thing, and, in, in, you know, the we've talked to some 300-plus people on the show, is, you know, at all levels, you know, from the, the person who's just starting to, the, you know, the, the cele- what would be considered a celebrity, um, they're all the same. We all have that same, like, little bit of fear putting something out, you know, when you're on your 15th album, it's a little less... Fear, but you know, uh, there, there's just a different set of fear. You know, like, are my fans gonna like it? Is it new? Is it too different than what I've put out before? My fans are gonna hate it. You know, so I mean, imposter syndrome it exists kind of at all levels. It's crazy, and I think up until the like super celebrities that just lose track of reality. But right, you know, 
I just think it's funny when you said, you know, how did you feel after you put this book out? And that I went through the whole creative process that I wrote about. Yeah. And well, it was just funny. Like, as you're it was talking about it, in me. my head, I'm like, I guarantee she had that kind well, of thing. Well, you were right. Because <laughs> you can't not have it. You're, yeah, you're, you're right. The thing about being creative is, is so personal. And then you, when you put it out there to the world, it's almost, it's never perfect because it's not a real thing. So you're always going to see the, the typo or be like, ah, I don't love that particular word or whatever whatever issue you have, you're always going to see that. And then you're putting it out to the world. And if anyone has anything to say about it, especially personally, if someone has something good to say about it, I brush it off being like, ah, they're being nice. Or, you know, they they don't know what else to say. Or I can't take a compliment. But if it's bad, I'm like, oh, they see me. <laughs> then you focus yeah. on that. Right? And it's because, like, part of the creative process is being so open and exposing yourself that you can't not be like that. And it's, it's, um, I spoke to a couple, um, a writer, an actress, and her husband's a director and an actor. And they worked on a movie together. And they're talking about, um, we're talking about relationships in general and um, they're like yeah they think part of what makes them work is because they both have that same sort of creative mindset that makes it easier to understand the other person and, and I think that's what I love about the show is every you know and they didn't know it when we started but all creative people are the same you know everyone has their own outlet but our mindsets are very similar so you see they play off each other. I mean, yeah, yeah. So they kind of, it alleviates some problems that I personally have had in my relationships. But um, that because they didn't have it because they understood kind of the creative process and like that self-doubt and that, you know, the other person could be in a, a total mood and be like, what's wrong? And be like, I can't make anything good. And be like, what are you talking? You know, like where if you're a creative person, you're kind of like, no, it's, this is just part of it. And so it, it's. We're weird people. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem is we're afraid to make mistakes. And you have to make mistakes yeah. to further that process mm-hmm. along, right? And to become more creative. And I think the self-doubt takes away from the creativity. Yeah. Because it's just, you're just so focused on that. You're not focused on how much further you can actually go. Yeah. Right? So, and I think in this book, the artist that I talk about, is that she's comparing herself to the best of the best, thinking that nature is the best. No, she's comparing herself to nature. To nature right? <laughs> yeah. But nature yeah. is not perfect. Yeah. So, and I think a lot of people have problems with that. I mean, you see a beautiful sunset and you're like, oh, that's perfect. And, yeah. But nature has anomalies. And I, I mean, we don't always see those when we're looking at the beautiful areas of nature, right? We're not into the, into seeing, you know, the animals that are, have anomalies mm-hmm. and the tree that's just not growing perfectly like all the other trees. And so I don't think you can ever say it's the best of the best for anything because everything has a flaw and and nothing is perfect. And I think the hardest thing for people who are perfectionists, I being one, is that you have to try to convince yourself that we're in an imperfect world. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very hard to do. Yeah. And um, I know visual artists that can take someone's photograph and render it to the point where their drawing is so good it looks like the photograph itself. Like you have trouble telling which is which. Mm -hmm. What's the point? Like it's perfect, but there's a photograph of that already. Like why? Like who cares? Mm -hmm. So... To me, it, it, you know, like you can look at impressionism, it, it, it's what are you conveying with all that work? Like if you can copy something and make it so photorealistic that it looks exactly how it is, I could have done that with a camera or I could have made a photocopy. I, I talked about, I was almost going to write a story about that um, and I know a good portion of the artists are probably going to hate to hear me say this right now. But I almost look at it as a form of plagiarism, right? 
Okay, sure. Um, because if I plagiarize in my book, yeah. you know, someone's going to come at me, right? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, whatever you say, although I'm not, I don't agree with pl- pl- um, plagiarism, you know, like Japan has no laws against right. plagiarism, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. plagiarism yeah. right? I don't agree with it because I can say something and you know for sure somebody somewhere has said the same thing, right? I mean, yep. how do you avoid that, right? It's, so I is copying a photograph or, um, you know, like you were just talking yeah. about copying the photograph, is that a form of artistic plagiarism as opposed to <sighs> literature? I don't know. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, I understand what you're saying. I don't know if it is. To me, I just, I don't, and like this person took hours. I'm like, I feel like you just wasted your time. Like it, it's amazing to be able to draw that realistic. But if you can't add to it, if you can't add something that's not already there, you're wasting your time. Like, what's the point? It's not really authentic. Yeah, right. it's, it's not. Yeah. It's not a genuine. It, it's not genuinely your interpretation, where I could see someone do something with four lines and it not look exact you know even close but if it can conveys a the idea of the image i find that more impressive you know you use four lines you did like the same thing that this guy did for hours right um and don't get me wrong if i could draw that picture like that guy I would do it in a second because I always wanted to draw and I just don't have that ability. I, and I think, have a real problem because I really, really, really want to do it. But then like intellectually, I'm like, why? Why am I wasting my time? I need to draw less constricted. And, and that's why I kind of get obsessed with these single line drawings. Mm-hmm. Um, but is that your form of perfectionism? Is that your form of creativity where the perfectionism is creating chaos for your creativity because you're looking at something that you think is perfect but a waste of time? Um, Do you see what I'm trying to No, it's interesting because I also, with the single line drawings, I find if I have too much time, I screw them up. So a much more limited time is better. Um, I feel like... I was very hard on myself because I wasn't getting that hyper photorealistic that I, for whatever reason, my brain, that perfectionism inside me wanted, that I was trying to give myself options out. And it started because I used to draw on pencil, and then you know, you'd erase and draw and erase and draw and erase and draw and erase and draw. And then uh, through a friend of mine uh, convinced me to draw in pen. Once it's there, it's there. Right. Now you're trying to incorporate your mistakes into what the drawing is, and they're never going to be photorealistic. I shouldn't say that. People can do it. Um, Mine aren't. But um, it brought me in a totally different direction. And then it was like, okay, let's try ink washes, because that... Your control's all over the place at that point because you're just putting wet stuff on wet paper and it's just kind of bleh and it goes where it wants, wants to go. To go. Um, so to me, it was more about giving up control that I needed to give up because I, I was putting... Because I was trying to do something that I knew I didn't really want. And so now it's kind of like putting restrictions on that perfectionism. I found a way to limit the perfectionism and kind of like get myself like that, kind of like, it's fine. It can't be perfect because of the way you're doing it. Um, And then I've gotten some of the best drawings I think I've ever done. Wow, that's great. It's bizarre. (laughs) (coughs) But it works. It does. It works. It does, and I really enjoy it. Um, Was there a limitation to, because I mean, it's a short book. Mm -hmm. Was that by design it did you just write and that's how it came out or were you like i'm gonna do i followed an a to z concept okay i read a book once where this um author hired some of the top authors in the country and challenged them to write a short story using a to z so you begin with the letter alphabet the letter a okay and that's your first line and then it could be three lines you know commas punctuation whatever then you go down and your next line has to start with the letter B all the way to Z, um, which is a great prompt, mm-hmm. but it's also a great challenge 
because I had to really think about the words I was putting in these short sentences sure. to convey what I wanted to convey, to bring about provocative thoughts so yeah. that you would read this one. Well, some pages have maybe... Why does this have, this line start with xylophone? <laughs> right, right. Uh, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Uh, that was... Yeah. So, um, yeah, some of them have four and five lines that are one complete sentence with punctuation. But, yeah, it's a great prompt. But it's also... It also inhibits your creativity sometimes, mm-hmm. too, because I'm limited to that first letter. Yeah. Right? So... So I said, I read this book and it was un- it was unbelievable, the stories these people came up, these short stories with A to Z. So I said, I'm going to take that challenge. So I wrote a bunch of A to Z short stories. And this one I really enjoyed. Um, and the story is about my sister, by the way, because she's an cr- unbelievable artist, but she can never... Yeah. Um, get out of her own way. Get her, get out of her own way. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I sent this book out to a um, book designer and an editor, and they called me right back, and they said, this would make a great short story. We really enjoy this story. And being creative and artistic, they could really relate to it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, there we go, creative process again. Are you sure? I yeah, don't yeah. know if I'm, you know. It is. So, um, yeah, I took the A to Z challenge. I did, you know, short sentences in the book. Um, and then I thought... Well, why not have someone illustrate it and bring life to these words? Mm -hmm. And so then I found an illustrator, and she and I worked fabulous together. There was just one step back. She said to me, I can't put a face on the artist. I don't do well with facial um, expressions. And I said, I don't want a face on the artist because I don't want someone to look at that artist and and see... um, I want them to feel, to see themselves. It could be anybody. It could be anybody, right? I don't want them to look and say, every time they think of this artist, they see facial features. Mm -hmm. I didn't want that. So we always, in the book, you never see the artist's face. You see her back and whatever. So I wanted it to be anybody. Um, So she was happy with that. And then we worked um, for almost a year. And we did very well together. And now we're great friends. Yeah. Um, Yeah, we keep in touch. And I give her as much... Um, as many compliments and f- for this book as you know I think she's just as responsible for this book as I am it's like a 50-50 yeah. maybe even more for her because she really had to put some work into those illustrations is she going to be at uh, Pages and Pint on August 20th at my uh, library she's out in <laughs> Montana um, she's a um, scientific illustrator and a natural oh, cool. uh, yeah. nature yeah you know, you know with nature and the other thing at the end of this book she did a lot of um birds and flora and fauna so we put a list in the back of the book of all the flora and fauna that's oh, incorporated that's cool. in the illustrations yeah. by page so if you see a photo of a bird i mean a, a picture Darn of man. a bird or some kind of flora um you can go back to the pages in the back of the book and you can read about how they are, what they are and how they're native to this part of the country. Oh, that's um, cool. I did a lot of photographs from where I, I live at Duxbury at Beach and I did a lot of photographs at the beach and the Gurna and she replicated those in watercolor. And So it has a lot of significance for the South Shore too. Yeah, yeah. And I just think, you know, if you are a creative person or if you struggle with perfectionism and self-doubt, I think it really can generate some really provocative um, discussions. Yeah. So I feel like everybody. I feel like if you don't struggle with self doubt, then there's probably something wrong. Something with you. wrong. <laughs> right. Because right. I mean, it, it's yeah, yeah it, and it's tough. It, it, it's really difficult to kind of put that mental mindset aside and. Well, we're always being critiqued. We're always yeah. being judged. The, the, that's life, right? So, but then when you put something out there that's from your heart, and it's like it's like I gave birth to this book. Yeah. Um, I worked on it for three years, and the year I was coming out with, you know, launching it, um, it was March, the beginning of March, twenty twenty, and then everything oh. shut down in the middle. Yeah. And I was taking a course at Harvard, and I remember the professor. We had a Zoom course. 
and we were all talking and for some unknown reason he brought this up and he said I really feel bad right now for anyone who's launching a book and I remember sitting back in my seat in my office thinking oh my god that's me yeah you know so the most I could do at that point was social media mm -hmm. and it did very well but I didn't have that luxury for over a year of doing book signings and talks and yeah and when I do have the opportunity to do a book signing and a talk on this book I just gear towards the perfectionism, the creativity, the self-doubt. Where it's such a small book um, and such a short story, I can't give anything away. In the right, 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 right. Yeah, because yeah. then yep. people are going to say, "Well, I know the book now. Why right. buy it? Why buy so, it?" Right. So, well, it'll make a great gift for somebody. It is. Yeah, I think it's a great <laughs> gift, and yeah. I, I do think. Uh, you know, I believe, I'm, I'm not being narcissistic here, I believe, you know, there are people who are just not going to like this book, let's of face course. it, right? Yeah. That's that's life. And if they don't, I would love for them to be honest with me and give me their feedback, as long as it's constructive and they're not mean and rude. Yeah, um, well, it, uh, yeah that's... In, there's a way to give the criticism, correct? It, but uh, Yeah, and I don't, I don't say that people should be mean or rude, but... I just have a reason. Right. Like, Be honest. I, all yeah. I ask is for the honesty. Yeah. You know, and point out the flaws that you think and, you know. And then again, I don't want people to just tell me they like it because they're being nice. Right. You know, I just, I put it out there. I love it. Um, but I do know that not everybody will. Yeah. And that's life. And It's but, tough finding those people. Because it's so built into our society to not... Even someone giving what you'd consider um, a, an honest critique, people would think that would be rude. Mm -hmm. And it's so built into our, our um, society that, you know, oh, no, that's great. And it, it it's not helpful. No, not, not in, not in yeah. with the creative process. Yeah, right? so you really need that person who's going to be straight up with you. And But a lot of my reviews, um, people said, I met the... For us, the biggest mistake I made with this book that they made with this book was they picked it up and they read it too quickly. Yeah. Um, and then they said, you know, we went back to it and we went line for line and we paused for a minute and we reflected on it. And that's what I want people to do. That was my goal. And then my neighbor the other day, she's been going through a tough time. And she said to me, I sat with my tea the other morning and I opened the book and I read a few lines and then I closed the book. And she said, I thought about things and... You know, she said, I bounced things around. And she said, so my goal now is for this week, every morning, I'm going to get up and have my tea and read the next line. Oh, and that's then cool. reflect on yeah, it. Yeah. So to me, that was, that was heartwarming yeah. for me. Because and then, and then I thought, wow, that's a really good way to approach it. And, and a genuine review, too. Like, right, that's right, That's kind right. of what you want. That's, right. Yeah, that's when you And she working. did say to me that she was happy to see that it wasn't a happy ending. Yeah. She goes, I am tired of reading books that have happy endings. And I said, well, sometimes that's not reality. Right. Right? I mean, you know, there are happy endings, but for the majority of the time, I have not seen too many. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm getting... Well, we all end up in the same place. Let's, you right, know. Right, right. Yeah. But, but I'm getting you know, feedback that starting to make me think, well, yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, uh, I never thought about looking at it this way or that way. And so um, I'm hoping people enjoy it. I'm looking forward to the, the marketplace. Um, and I just... Pages and Pints, August 20th, Mayflower Brewery. That one? That one. That's <laughs> what I'm looking forward to. And, you know, when I did the other marketplaces through Inebriat, I did very well. People, yeah. And I was excited because people didn't just come up, look at the book and say, oh, I'll purchase that. Some people went through it. We discussed it. Some people read it right at the table because it's very short, but yet they still purchased it. I was going to say, I hope they... Right. Like, no, they still did. No, they weren't yeah. rude about okay. it, but... So, and I had some really good discussions with people. So, um, yeah, I hope people enjoy it. I hope I do well at the marketplace. I have done well at all the other ones. Um, and I just... Do you have a, a, another book that you're in the process of? I do have another book written. I just haven't... We haven't gone through the process of the editing and the... I would use the same illustrator if I was. Yeah. But it's a children's book. Um, which I've been told are very hard to 
branch off with it, because there's so many. Of I was going to say it's a very, yeah. very saturated marketplace. Yeah. So I have written yeah. one. Um, it's a children's book, and I'm hoping to get that out. But I just, I'm so happy with this one right now. I right. feel like you're living in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. The, and, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sit here and sound conceited. No, I'm but not, that's a great I'm place to live. I'm not saying it's you know? the best. I, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that will find fault with that. But for me, it was always my dream to write a book. Mm-hmm. But I'm not a novel type of... I love reading novels. But I like to get into the specifics of something and the detail of something in very few words. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't like the long, drawn-out process of um, description and all this in, like, paragraphs. And I admire people who could do that because I don't have the patience to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, and I've always liked to write. I, m- what I like to write the most are haikus. Okay. I love writing haikus. And when I, lo- when I write long poetry, they're in haiku form. So yeah. they're all a bunch of little haikus that, you know, form into one major poem. I wish I could. I used to have a haiku that, like, memorized, but it was something like haikus are short poems. They don't have to make sense. Refrigerator or something like that. Uh, yeah, you always yeah, come yeah, up with yeah. that like, last that line. It's so funny. <laughs> so. Um, but uh, I want to say thanks for coming on the show. Where can people go to get um, an afternoon by the sea if for some reason they can't make pages and pints on August 20th at the Mayflower Brewery? Well, I have Larnos Publishing. That's okay. my company. So it's um, all caps, L-A-R-N-O-S dot publishing at gmail.com. Okay. And they can get on there and the square will pop up. It's $20. Um, it's hardcover. If you take the sleeve off, it's also embossed. Oh, nice. Yeah, so if they didn't like the sleeve or they just want to put it on a bookshelf where the embossing shows. Um, so, yeah, it's um, I, it's my baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, you know, it was a long process, and it's funny that I went through the whole process after the I created it that I wrote about. So, um, but that just that just shows you how universal it is. You know, it is. Yeah. Do we have time for me to just read yeah, this quickly? Yeah, sure. Read. I just wanted to say that the inspiration for this book came from an incident I witnessed that made me realize the magnitude of perfectionism. It's ability ability to taunt the mind and the turmoil that can hide behind the facade of a work of art. As an art lover who has never felt talented enough to paint, I chose to express the perspective of the artist through writing this story and realize that the practice of creativity in any form often encompasses conflicting feelings and self-doubt. My hope is that through this story, you, the reader, will consider the many facets of an artistic creation. There is more to creativity than the tools or subjects that the artist used to create. There are psychological components as well. I think that's the perfect spot to stop. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. it. And thanks for checking out the show today, listeners. Uh, if you enjoyed the content today, you can go over to patreon.com slash inebriart to support the show. You can join over there for just a few dollars a month and help us provide this fun content that you just checked out. You can also email us at inebriart.com with your questions, complaints, and concerns. Or you can find us on all social medias at inebriart or at inebriart6 on Instagram. And also don't forget to check out our other shows, Bar Talk Podcast, Old Colony Cast, Inebriart, and all the other shows on the Inebriart Network, which you can find at inebriart.com. Thanks again for listening.